Welcome back to the Valley to Peak Nutrition Podcast. We have Mike Moore on the podcast this week. Mike's name is maybe not one that rings a bell right whenever you hear it, but you may be more familiar with his alias on a lot of the outdoor forums, Mountain Warden. We get to hear the story behind the name as well as an awesome goal that Mike has set for this year to tick off the number of miles in the mountains as there is in the AD calendar for the years this year. We glean from the years of wisdom that he's obtained working in the mountains, playing in the mountains, recreating in the mountains, and a host of other things. This ranges from nutrition to training to gear reviews that he writes for Rockslide, as well as some precarious situations he's found himself in and how he dealt with them. As always, I hope you enjoy the show, and I genuinely feel like there will be a nugget of something in here that you can pull and add to your arsenal of things, um, whether it's nutrition, whether it's training, whether it's skills for the mountains whenever you're about, whether it's with safety. He really covers a lot of really great stuff, and he was a, he was a wonderful guest, and in spite of this being his, his very first podcast, I think he did a phenomenal job, and so I'm excited for you all to listen. As always, if there are episodes or topics that you want to hear about, I am always open to hearing what those are. You can send those over to info at v2pnutrition.com, and we would be more than happy to cover those. So without further ado, here are a few lessons from Mike for 2,023 miles in 2023. I've I've followed along with some of your um, posts and advice that you've given on Rockslide and some of the like post-trip reports that you've done and thought, man, this guy seems really interesting and really knowledgeable. And then I like, I started to dabble, you know, like I would just be researching something and usually it was gear. If there's a particular gear that I was interested in, like I'd, I'd research it a little bit before I'd go out and buy it. And I started seeing your name pop up on other, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's user-friendly database review sites or what it was. And I couldn't even tell you the name offhand, but your name would pop up on random forums for trail running. And, um, I don't think I've seen you on Reddit, but maybe you're on Reddit. Anyway, I just thought he's really interesting. And so then I saw in your tagline, uh, I recent you you did the gear review on Rockslide, which I'd love to talk a little bit about during this because everyone who listens to this, of course, likes gear to some degree. Uh, I saw that you were doing two thousand twenty three miles in twenty twenty three. I thought, what a cool goal, and what a um, what a and what an adventurous goal because I mean, you've got to be. Those aren't like miles where you think, ah, I'll just go out a couple times a week, rack up a few miles and see where I end up. I mean, you got to be pretty intentional about logging miles to get the full 2000. And so any, everything with the podcast for me is really like, I want people to be able to shut it off and feel like it was worth their time and they got something out of it that they can go use and apply. I don't have any interest in like just filling the airwaves with my voice, like there's enough of those. <laughs> so you're truly it's your, your approach could be very scientific and it could be very basic. And I think that both are extremely helpful because like in the world where we data things to death, some of the, like some of the best simply go by feel, they don't use any data. And on the flip side of that, sometimes the data people love to nerd out about the data. So if you use a combination of both of those, that's um, that's what we'll talk about. Good. So I think like whenever I um, whenever we record it and I release it, I'll do just a little introduction to kind of say, you know, who you are, but I will fail to some degree. So I would love just to start by having you introduce yourself. And we talked a little bit about this whenever we set this up. I said, how'd you get interested in the mountains? Because you weren't you're not originally from Montana. Well, let's see. I currently live in Helena, which is central Montana with my wife, 41 years and two children grandchildren. I was raised in New York State, upstate New York. I just had this dream of becoming, you know, a game warden in the West. And I uh, pursued that dream. I started out in a little community college in northwestern Montana, or excuse me, northwestern Wyoming, taking wildlife biology. Met a gentleman there. We we became friends. And when I was uh, down there, He invited me to Northwest Montana to get a job working in the woods. I said, I don't know nothing about it, but, you know, I'm game. And so I was introduced to the logging business and uh, ended up pursuing that for three or four years, kind of off and on, going to school in Missoula and working. That's 
where I met my wife was up in the little town of Eureka. Turned out that it was the boss's daughter that I ended up marrying. So, so did you did you grow up in, in New York? Like, did your did your folks or or grandparent introduce you to some of the eastern mountains, and that's sort of how you had this interest in it, or did you did that naturally come and you wanted to go west? Yeah, even as a kid, you know, I just spent a lot of time outdoors. Um, you know, hiking. My dad had a had a place that, you know, by New York standards was fairly big. It was like 120 acres. And then it was, you know, we'd explore that. I'd hunt it, camp out in the winter and it, stuff like that. So I've always been interested in the outdoors and stuff. I did fairly young age. I mean, I just had this drive to be a game warden and kind of specifically, um, you know, somewhere in the Western, just kept plugging away. And uh, uh, my college degree, I mean, I started mid-70s. I didn't graduate until late 80. Shortly after that, fortunately, they had a fairly large hiring in Montana, and I was lucky enough to get hired, so... So I've never, I've never actually had the pleasure of sitting down with a game warden, and I think I would, I would regret not asking this. And I'm sure that this is like, I'm sure there are countless of these, but any or the wildest story that you can remember from being a game warden that stands out in your mind to this day. Oh, yeah. There's yeah, probably there's, a, lot, a lot of them. Yeah, there's, there? there's a few. Um, we, uh, I got in. Uh, when I started just starting wildlife decoys, uh, my sergeant at the time was really interested in it, and he put together a decoy that uh, was on a uh, two-legged archery target, shooting a deer and saving the high, tanned it himself, sewed it up. It looked like hell. We stuck some antlers on it. That thing got shot a lot. It was surprising to me that something that looked like that, but it was fairly new. Eventually, we went into robotics and, I mean, stuff, eyes that would glow in the dark. One evening, work in this area south of Miles City, where we had a lot of spot lighting along the Tongue River. Midnight, one o'clock, the fellow that I was with, uh, we both, I mean, we both just fell asleep. We'd been patrolling most of the day and then most of the night, and we just fell asleep. And uh, we were woken to a loud centerfire rifle shot that was, you know, just 40 yards from us you know, on the opposite side of the road where we had that decoy. And I mean, we both hit our heads on top of the truck, looked at each other, you know, because it was like a moment of like, where the hell am I? And, you know, anyways, we were able to take care of business and stuff. And, uh, but uh, that that's one of several I remember. <laughs> yeah, the decoys, I know like um, growing up from the, growing up in the Midwest, where there's obviously just whitetail, probably as many whitetails there is people in some parts. That was a big, that was a big thing that, you know, wardens would use would be setting up the decoys and busting people for the illegal take of game. But I can only imagine some of the stories that, um, <laughs> some of the stories that you've got. One of the things, and I, I said this in the introduction, that I was fascinated by after sort of inadvertently following along with all of your stuff online and on Rockslide was I saw in your tagline, you had this goal of 2,023 miles in 2023, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on just to talk about that. Can you describe a little bit about what you've got planned and how you came up with that as as the actual objective for the year? Sure. Um, I'm not a runner anymore, but I was a runner. I started running late in mid-50s. Um, we had a little get together with the wardens and we decided to come up with just a voluntary physical fitness thing where we would meet routinely, you know, every couple, three months and that we would have like a, you know, just a couple hour assessment, you know, push ups, pull ups, chin ups, and, you know, some kind of running thing. So, um, not to look like a fool cause I was never a runner. I, you know, I started running. And um, eventually, I mean, I really got hooked on it uh, enough so that, I mean, I started entering trail races and stuff like that. And anyways, at that juncture, when I became a little bit more into the running thing, I started keeping track of miles. And it was in that ballpark of, you know, 2,000 miles that I was running, you know, give or take a couple hundred. And anyways... 
four or five years ago, I've kind of switched to hiking instead of running. It, and my miles were in that same ballpark, just takes longer. And um, anyways, when I looked at one of my years, it was, you know, just shy of, you know, whatever the year was. And so the next year, so this would have been maybe just two or three years ago, I said, that's going to be my goal. 2021 miles, you know, for that year. So the last couple of years I've made it, knock on wood, I'm still on schedule for this year. So. So do you have a, like, do you have a particular, you know, going into the year and I, I'm, I will, I will preface this by saying that I'm guilty of overthinking. So if that falls in this category, feel free to tell me. <laughs> do you have a way that you're breaking this up? I mean, are you trying to chip away at a specific number of miles per week? Or do you just think, you know, all right, I'm going to go out today. I'm going to hike. I'm going to see how far I can get and just accumulate miles. Or are you really, you know, taking like a weekend and piling up a ton of miles, but not really doing it during the week? Because that, you know, like we were talking about before we started recording, you could get a couple hundred miles really without trying, right? I mean, you could go out and just kind of intentionally, just intentionally plan to be out four or five days a week and probably get close to a couple hundred miles within the course of a year. 2000 is a different deal. <laughs> so it makes me wonder, you know, how, how are you, how are you breaking that down um, to, to make sure that you get that point? I fully retired a year ago. I was uh, doing some contract work for the U.S. Marshals here, and then I gave that up. So now I'm fully retired. So I've got lots of time. Anyways, I hike basically every day with my little dog. We, on a normal week, you know, we rack up 30, 35 miles a week. Hikes are, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. You know, we'll miss a day here and there, but not too often. And then I've always got things planned in the year, you know, trips, you know, like that one we were talking about earlier in Arizona. Those trips, you know, you end up racking up some bigger miles, 80 in a week, 100 in a week. And between the steady eddy, you know, 30, 35 miles a week, and then these trips sprinkled in, um, it usually puts me in that ballpark. And, you know, frankly, if it starts getting towards the end of the year, and I mean, I need 42 miles, I mean, uh, it, it's just my nature. I mean, somehow I'm going to gonna go ahead and do it and get them. So. This may even have you reach back as deep as like when you first started running in your mid 50s. But what do you feel like has been the greatest lesson in having a pretty audacious goal and trying to achieve it because I'm sure like now you might be in such a good rhythm that no issue really comes up. You don't, you don't really have new challenges, but I can imagine a guy going from, you know, pretty standard acti activity to none to all of a sudden basically committing to taking on 2000 miles in a year and becoming a runner was at, at the very least pretty mentally. And I would imagine somewhat physically challenging when you first started do you remember anything from that? Any lessons from that or things that you did to sort of push through that? Are you familiar with uh, Michael Easter, his work? Anyways, you know, he, Comfort crisis. he wrote an entire book about you know, challenging yourself, getting out of your comfort zone. And I, I don't know, I just think that's an important thing for everybody to do. You know, not every day, obviously, but, you know, at some junction in in a year you know a person really needs to kind of get out of that place and type stuff and you know be uncomfortable it, it might be a, a you know a goal or something that uh you know you don't make which is fine because uh those are often the, you know the places and the times that you're learning more than making the goal so i just think uh part of it's you know kind of my personality as far as keeping track of stuff and very consistent with my you know, fitness have been, that's never been like a giant problem for me. So definitely helps when I'm setting up goals. I think, I think it's a great suggestion. And the point that you bring up about even, even if you've been doing it as long as you have, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be easy every day. There's some discomfort involved. And 
I, I think like, uh, and maybe this is just me speaking, you can tell me if you feel different, but perhaps the most rewarding thing is looking back retrospectively and seeing those, know that you went through them. And that's kind of what keeps you going back, right? I mean, if it was just very, very simple without any hiccups or, you know, without any challenge, whether it be a physical challenge or something else, mental challenge, it's not quite as rewarding. And so I like the fact that you bring up just because it may be routine doesn't mean that it's always easy. And that's really the reward. And and from an overall, like just the way that you view life perspective, it's very likely, and we see this a lot. Um, I see, I see this a lot with the, the folks that come through Valley to Peak. It's like if, if they all of a sudden start paying attention to the details of their nutrition, that's very likely to bleed over into other areas in their life. And um, this, I think that that's, that's to do with the development of habits and nothing to do with me, obviously. But it's been neat for me to be an observer and see someone who doesn't necessarily feel like their life is without direction, but all of a sudden start to develop a direction. And, you know, through it happens to be through Valley to Peak. Sometimes it's some other catalyst. And then all of a sudden, like, they start talking about their relationship with their kids or their wife getting better simply because they're now doing the dishes, whereas before they just would go lay on the couch. Or now they're doing the laundry because they're just trying to be more intentional with their life. It's like it's like it changes their whole perspective on really everything. It just This just happened to be the catalyst. And so it sounds like, like for, from what you're saying for your message is, the whole getting out of your comfort zone isn't just to, you know, it's, it's a very, it's a very sort of um, popular and bougie thing to be hard right now. Right. Like, you know, we could name a number of different people who are all over social media and advocating everyone stays hard. I, like, I don't even think that it's, it's that necessarily. It's that you're staying in a mindset of, okay, this is going to be a challenge, but I'm going to take it on anyway. Exactly. Um, it, um, you know, obviously it's something I enjoy, so that makes it easier. You're right. I mean, you know, I'm out there almost every day in you know, Montana. It doesn't have the nicest weather, so there are a lot of times when it would be easier just to bag it, and uh, I don't kind of get bundled up, go hit the trails. You know, this morning we had three or four inches of snow in town, and Know, probably five or six inches of snow up in the hills where I was hiking and, you know, wind was blowing. It was still snowing. I mean, sit at home drinking a hot latte than going up there, but it's like, get it done. And, and you enjoy it once you're out there. I mean, I do. I mean, my wife and I were out uh, yesterday and uh, definitely was not the nicest weather. We got grappled on. We got snowed on. We got rain on all in about an hour and 15 minutes thoroughly enjoyed it it was just a lot of fun and nobody else was hardly out with is a great transition point you didn't know that i would segue into this but that's a great point you one of one of the reasons that i really started to follow along with you like on rock slide is so i do i write um gear reviews for backwoods pursuit and a couple of other things and i just enjoy the nerdery behind the gear different fill power with insulated jackets and different materials and how they wick sweat or they don't wick sweat and they breathe and they don't breathe and i started noticing that you wrote reviews too like one of the reasons i really started to see your name pop up was through some of the gear reviews that i would read i'm curious how and when you developed an interest for gear and learning some of the behind the scenes nuances with stuff like that by the very nature i mean hunting is a gear intensive uh hobby as is backpacking and so i mean those are pursuits you're interested in i mean at some juncture i mean going to start from the end of the year um you know the other thing is is that get your gear more dialed in you can backpack farther longer you know your hunting starts becoming more successful i mean it's obviously not the only thing that makes you successful as a hunter but i mean it definitely adds to the comfort and the you know pleasantness of it even though it may not be unpleasant if uh, you know your clothing is dialed in and your gears performing as it is i think it was just natural with those kind of hobbies that at some point i mean you're going to be looking at gear discussing gear you know trying gear out what works, what doesn't. Yeah, one of my, uh, like one of the um, the phrases that I love or 
tell myself a lot and maybe this is just an excuse to buy gear <laughs> but it's like i feel like the difference between having and I'm, i'll use this in quotes good gear versus okay gear is really the difference between asking the question should we go today or what should we wear today right it's like if 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 the if the gear is built for the environment and to take on some of the elements that you know happens year round in the west and i'm sure other places too it's like if you if you have decent if you have gear built for those elements then you really don't have any reason not to go sure there may not be as many there may not be as many animals up and moving but i think some of the greatest experiences that i've had on the mountain have been days that i've gone out when a lot of people have stayed in camp because the weather was crummy and what tends to happen is is like as you're making your way up to you know some of the higher elevations to be on a ridge or whatever you're very likely to get a little window somewhere in there you know even if it's like 30 minutes 45 minutes an hour maybe everybody else is back at camp and you're the only one up there and those animals love those windows and i mean some of the most memorable times that i can i can think of have been the times where you're just kind of up there waiting either for clouds to break or rain to stop or snow to stop or whatever breaks for a little bit. And then it's like the window of opportunity in every way thinkable happens. Now, of course you don't have to buy the coup de grave gear. You could go up there with anything, but for me, quote, good gear. Cause I'm a, sh I'm a very short guy. I'm five foot six. I'm, I don't weigh much. So the, like a small, and I won't, I won't use like, actual brands but a small and some lower quality brands swallows me and just makes me feel very aloof whereas a, a, you know that same size and brands that are a bit more tailored just don't make me feel like that i just feel so much more comfortable i'm not constantly adjusting myself and moving and just like wanting to get out of them and so i don't think that it's so much about a price tag as much as as much as um fit you recently did a really good gear review for Rockslide, which I'll link in the show notes so people that are interested can go and check it out. And you did a lot of the standard testing, right? Like what is the advertised weight of the garment? What's the actual weight? What are some of the features? All that stuff. But then you took it next level <laughs> and got yourself wet and then tried to determine, okay, well, what is it going to take? How long time-wise is it going to take for this product to dry out? Because at that point, you know, some, sometimes to the point of buying good, quote, good gear, it could be, this seems dramatic and sometimes people play on this, but could be life-saving for, in, in that example, if you get wet and you can't necessarily get out, how fast that's going to dry could literally help keep you warm, save your life. Can you talk about just the, the approach that you took for the review that test specifically and anything that stands out as a finding whether that's one piece of the gear that you tested is kind of standing out as as the i don't want to say the best because all of them have different features but anything on that that you would speak to i decided uh kind of you know like halfway through this was a long review because i had i think i had five different pieces and one of them i got pretty late in the game after hunting season at some point it kind of just hit me that to do that wet base layer test that came from an incident last winter when a buddy of mine got the great idea of uh, snowshoeing across the bob marshall wilderness on a hundred mile endeavor and probably never to be repeated one of those days mid trip i got swept by a crick wet literally you know i think everything but my hat was completely so i think uh it might have been Sitka gear it might have been somebody else but uh they posted up some information that some of the special forces um, folks were doing where, you know, if you had found yourself in this situation, the normal you know, idea was, you know, stop, you know, get a fire going. And that's not a bad idea. That can work. But, you know, for special forces guys, I mean, that might not be an option if they're you know, behind enemy lines. But anyways, they said if, uh, if you find yourself in a situation like that, bring your clothing all best as you can, you know, get a layer, a warm layer over the top of that and basically hike your butt off. And that's what I did. My buddy was ahead of me by, you know, he was probably a couple of miles ahead of me. So he had no idea I got swept. And so I put a mid layer on and just started uh, hiking real hard. 
And lo and behold, I mean, after, you know, it was probably an hour and a half. I mean, I could feel myself, that base layer, you know, starting to get drier. And eventually it was fully dry. Uh, we ended up ended up catching up with him. We started a fire and my pants needed still a little drying and stuff. But anyways, from that experience, I figured it would be kind of fun with those different mid layers to take the same base layer, get it soaking wet, bring it out just a little bit, weigh it. Also, it was the same, you know, weight every time. I would drive to the trailhead. I had a four-mile loop that I used the same loop pretty close. I could keep that pace within, you know, just a couple minutes of each other. And what I would do is don that wet, terribly wet, cold <laughs> thing. You know, it was 32 degrees is what I decided on the temperature. And it had to be within a degree or two of that, or, I, you know, I'd wait another day to do that task. And then I'd just start hiking my butt off. And when I was done, I'd, uh, I'd weigh both the, the mid layer, the outer garment, to see, you know, if it absorbed water, how much, and then weigh that base layer and, you know, how much water had been removed from that. And then between the two, I could tell how much total moisture was removed by both garments, you know, totally, ex you know, the best case scenario is when you're done that the mid layer didn't have any water in the base layer, but we're talking maybe an hour and 15 minutes. And actually, I, with enough time, I mean, I'm convinced that, you know, within two, two and a half hours, I mean, all those garments would have been, everything would have been bone dry. That's that's how I kind of got the idea for the test, you know, from the real life experience and thought it would be interesting. Was there, uh, of the five pieces you tested, were there any real standouts in your mind? Um, you know, the one that, I guess, surprised me most was the OR piece I did. It was uh, basically a traditional grid fleece, not super heavy, not not real light either, um, but you know, kind of a mid-weight grid fleece, easily the most breathable garment that there was. And sometimes you kind of equate, you know, something being breathable is going to be drying faster. That thing, you know, it, it did pretty good, but it it didn't dry as well as the other. And I think part of that it was is that it was wet. The, the garment, you know, was directly against my base layer. and It was wet. I started getting frost up my arms and stuff. And, and you know, I tried to keep the wind, you know, the same. And it seemed like there was always a little bit of breeze on all the, each of those tests. And, I mean, you know, just the slightest breeze. I mean, I just, you know, <laughs> it hurt. <laughs> Anyways, so here's the most breathable garment out there, but it didn't dry out very well. Part of it, I think, was fit. But I think part of it, too, is just because it was so breathable, you know, it wasn't letting my, you know, core kind of heat things up or a little heavier garment. You know, I'm going to get that heat factor going and start, you know, that's what's going to drive that moisture out is your body heat. So anyways, that kind of surprised me. I thought it would do pretty well. And it, and it did decently. I mean, I'm not saying it did bad. It's just that uh, I thought it might actually do the best just because it was so breathable. But breathable is only one you know, characteristic. Was there, was there one that seemed to dry out the base layer fastest or faster than the others? Uh, the one that actually dried out the quickest uh, was the first light garment I had. And it that kind of surprised me a little bit too because it was uh, older school. It's uh, uh, it's a straight fleece garment. It's got a hard face on the outside, um, and then kind of a traditional soft fleece on the inside. And I, in my guesstimate, I thought it would be kind of a middle of the road, but that one actually uh, moved the most moisture out of all of them. They all moved a lot of moisture. So I mean the difference between you know one you know, next one wasn't a lot um but that one did surprisingly well well better than i thought i think if i remember right what you're describing is that the is it a furnace first light furnace does that sound right nope i think it's the origin yeah okay does it have the little kangaroo pocket up front yes it's a half zip you're right. And the, the OR piece is the vigor, if I remember right. That's correct. 
I like I liked um I like that piece too. But to your point, I've not gotten it wet, so I don't know I don't know what that <laughs> I don't know that end of things. But it's extremely breathable to the point of where I've gone to um put it on for like an early morning hike or run or whatever. It's been so cold that I've thought, I don't know that this thing's going to keep the wind off of me enough to keep me warm throughout the, the hike. So yeah, it does breathe extremely well and could be like a good early fall piece or something, I would, I would guess. Yeah, and I mean, uh, even on these little daily hikes, I carry a little and have a little uh, lightweight wind shirt that I throw in because that's me kind of the great equalizer. I mean, the things get thrown that light wind layer over the top of whatever I'm wearing. I mean, it just adds enough warmth and, you know, and it sheds a little light moisture and it definitely you know, knocks the wind out. So anyways, that's a little five day trip or you know, just for an hour and a half out on my daily hike. I mean, one of those go with me. I'll get a ton of emails if you don't tell people what, which one you use. You know, honestly, I use, uh, I use several. I've got, uh, I've got a, Patagonia Houdini that I've had for a long time. It's probably you know, the lightest one out there or close to it. So light, it's not quite as durable, you know, for certain bushwhacking or hunting or stuff. That's not the one I'm going to grab. Um, I've got one from Black Diamond, but it's a little heavier fabric. Formance wise, I think it's on par. It's just going to stand a little bit more brush and stuff. Testing a new one out from uh, Kaifuru. I think it's called the Wind River. It's a fairly light one. Stouter fabric, pretty even there. Anyways, it, it kind of depends. Um, I've got a military one. Patagonia for a while was uh, building actually quite a bit of gear for the military. Made by Patagonia, but for the military. I was able to grab one off eBay a long time ago when they're reasonable now. Almost like collector items, but... Uh, that's a pretty solid wind shirt. Again, a little bit more durable. Anyways, so I've got a slug of them. <laughs> this is probably like asking you to pick your favorite kid, but do you have a, if you think about all of the garments that you've got, and let's just stick to like jackets or mid layers or whatever, is there one that stands out as a favorite over others? Oh, boy. Um, I will say that uh, I do like, this newer Alpha Direct insulation for a mid layer. It one, it eliminates the need for an inner fabric. So you know, traditionally on a mid layer, other than a fleece, you have a two layer garment with some kind of insulation in between those two fabrics. This Alpha Direct takes away the need for a for an inner thing. So that one that's just straight Alpha Direct with no outer fabric looks like one of your you know, favorite fuzzy sweaters. It's kind of a, that stuff um, for a mid layer, I've been pretty impressed with. It's just comfortable to wear. You know, it moves moisture, um, you know, has a good weight to warmth ratio. Sitka was pretty early on to grab some of those pieces. They've um, since gone to another one in their ambient. It's not made by Polar Tech, I think it's Primal often, I'm not going to remember. I think it's Evolved, that's it. And anyways, comparing them side by side under their microscope, I'm, in, I'm sure there could be or is differences, but they look very similar. They feel the same. To me, they perform the same. Anyways, garments with either of those um, have been pretty impressive. I like them. Yeah, the um, bo both of those I would agree with you on, and um Arcteryx has one that they call Octoloft that's similar. I mean, I'm sure that there is some differences when you start like really, really digging into there. I'm sure that the the insulation companies would tell you there's huge differences, but to the consumer, the feel and the performance would be similar, which is like you start, you know, you do something active, not only is the outer material not preventing the jacket from getting air in or escaping, but that that Primalof evolved or the the Octoloff or any of those sort of pulls the moisture off of you too so you get breathability but you're also not just soaking wet like you would get with say like a a sweatshirt or some other material that doesn't breathe well so I'd, i would agree with you too uh, when i asked that question i was thinking in my head of 
all of the ones that I own or have tried, is there one that I would, if my wife said, look, you got to get rid of all these, you can only keep one, what I would choose. First of all, that would be a very hard choice to make, but I think I would probably uh, agree with you. I would probably lean towards one of those too. My uh, wife has one that we got from uh, outdoor research. It's uh, been discontinued, sadly, because I mean, a lot of people like it. I won't remember the brand, but it was one of the first ones that came out with the Alpha Direct. And um, anyways, she were uh, living heck out of it. it. It covers such a wide range of things. That's the you know, other thing I noticed in that testing that uh, particular insulation where it when it's pretty cold, but I mean, it'll stretch beyond where a lot of fleeces might be uncomfortably warm. It's usually the first one she'll grab out of the closet. She grabs it a lot. So I love that. I, I, I wish I could remember the name of it, but I think I know which piece you're talking about. So since this is, you know, obviously a podcast oriented towards outdoors, but also mainly nutrition, I'm curious if on, you know, the hikes that you've done, the, you know, pursuing bigger hikes like the 20 and 23, and even maybe the trip that you just returned from, is there any particular nutrition strategies, takeaways, things that you've done to find particularly helpful as you've racked up the miles over the years? You know, it's kind of like gear, you know, it's something that, you know, you got to get dialed in and like gear too, you're kind of always experimenting and stuff. When I was running ultras, you know, one of the lessons that you learn pretty darn quick is uh, calorie intake is important. Not only what you're putting in, but when you're putting it in, you know, everybody's a little different, small amounts more often versus, you know, like maybe three squares, you know, if you're running a, a long race or something like that. Not exactly what I do with backpacking, but it's close. I mean, I try to, you know, I'll eat a breakfast, I'll stop for a lunch break, I'll eat supper just like everybody else. But I'm also snacking in between, you know, trying to get, you know, 100 calories here, 100 calories there, you know, every hour, every hour and a half, every two hours, whatever. But anyways, that kind of, you know, keeping that, furnace going anyways that's a strategy that you know i kind of took from the ultra running and adapted a little bit from course hiking so it's not exactly the same you know what i'm using and stuff like that it works you know i do an event in the spring at the end of may the bob marshall wilderness open it sounds like you, i think I, I saw your name with the uh, exo death march oh, yeah. anyways it's a similar event alaska wilderness classic i mean these some of these have been around for a while. Uh, there was a fellow from Montana that did the Wilderness Alaska Classic a couple times, and he lived in the Flathead up in northwestern Montana, and he decided that we could do our own classic, basically, you know, with the Bob Marshall Complex, with the Great Bear, the Scapegoat, and the Bob Marshall Wildernesses. Each and every Memorial Day weekend, you know, a bunch of crazy people get together. You know, it's not a race. It's not... You don't sign up. There's no T-shirts. He picks a starting point and an ending point, and every year it changes. So, you know, one year you might be going south to north. You know, the next year you're going southeast to northwest, and every year it's different. You pick your route. There's no designated route. So you got people going this way, that way. You know, you might cross paths, and then you can use rafts. So you know, guys are carrying those little inflatable rafts and stuff like that it's not unusual to be hiking 12 14 16 18 hours during that event that's something that you know three square meals ain't gonna work i mean you gotta be fuel and continually anyways that's something that i've been doing for the last six or seven years it's excellent advice i mean so we like the the phrasing that we'll use to that is totals and timing right i mean sometimes it's hard for people to remember specifics and you and i were talking before we hit record about you know data ing too much like using data as a verb um and so we'll i try to attach like simple phrases to good concepts and so your point of fueling regularly and often totals matter but timing matters even more you could have everything you need on the planet but to your point if you're only taking those in three times over the stretch of of a day at some point during those inter intervals and those incremental time points, you're going to hit a wall. So the name of the game is keeping those fuel stores topped off. So it's excellent, excellent advice. Before we let you go, 
I, I also, this is, to me, this is like the equivalent of having a, a former game warden and not asking him any stories. How, <laughs> for, for, for those of us listening that are new, and by new, I mean like, let's say 10 or 20 years into it or less, what's the key tip making it to 42 years of marriage? Well, I don't know about the key tip, but I mean, one tip is, uh, I think it's important to have a good sense of humor. I think it's important to, you know, be able to, you know, pursue your interests, allowing your spouse to pursue their interests. Equally as important to be uh, that you have some common interests and that you take the time to get those common interests and do those things. I'm lucky that my wife, she's not a hunter, but... Uh, she does like to hike. She likes to backpack. It's kind of funny, but last year it was our 41st anniversary. We have a kind of a fancy restaurant uh, west of town that we like. We go there maybe two, three times a year tops because it's very expensive, but two or three weeks out. And I said, uh, should I make reservations at our restaurant? She's like, well, yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. And so I waited another week and you know, if you don't get a reservation, you're going. So I said, yeah. She goes, I'm not sure. And I said, well, can't we just go backpacking? That, that's one of the reasons <laughs> we've been married a long time. But anyways, I thought that was pretty cool. So we, uh, yeah, that's awesome. we had a good meal. We brought little uh, bacon wrap, little steak fillets, and those little kind of colored potatoes and all seasoned up and in a tinfoil pack. And so anyways, we had a pretty fancy meal up on that Jeez, the- that's uh, that sounds like that'd be tough to put a price tag on at all. I think that's yeah. great advice. I sure appreciate you taking some time to sit down, and chat with us, talk about the twenty and twenty three, and talk about gear, talk about nutrition, talk about your past and and all of that. And um, you know, I don't think that people will have any clue at all that this is your first podcast, maybe <laughs> the first of many handled it like a veteran and i uh, i sure appreciate it thank you for joining us yeah thanks kyle for calling me and inviting me i i think if you remember when the, the first floated past me i was like uh, i think i might have to pass anyways it's good kind of like we talked earlier getting out of your comfort zone so i mean definitely was out of my comfort zone but you made me feel welcome and so thanks for doing that Thanks for joining us this week and thanks to Mike for agreeing to brave the waters of the podcast land. I think he did an awesome job again. I will link everything that we talked about in the show notes uh, for the episode. This will include some of the garments that he had mentioned, um, the big gear review that he wrote for Rock Slide, a link to that. He also talked about the rewarming drill. He had mentioned Sitka, but Stone Glacier had also um, done something similar. So I'll link both of those if you're interested. They're, even if you don't plan to find yourself swept up a river, <laughs> they are, um, they're both really fascinating to learn some of the science behind garment, how it can wick moisture. So if you get you know, a spare 10 minutes, you may, you may check those out. Hopefully this will give you easier access to look at those so you don't have to go searching the interwebs for them. We'll be back again in a couple of weeks with another new episode. If there's topics that you want to hear about, again, always open to covering those. You can send them to me at info at v2pnutrition.com. We just recently launched um, our foundations course, which is 20 weeks of the the topics in nutrition that I have found to be the biggest hangups for people. And again, our goal for you is to create autonomy so you can navigate the waters of nutrition and fitness and all of those things on your own. You're not left to wonder Am I doing this right? How do I navigate this web of confusion? Foundations is designed to help give you at least the very um, start of those answers. We've also got Foundations Plus, which is everything just outlined, but you, along with four other people, meet with me once per month to dive in deeper to a chunk of those topics over the course of a couple of months, get questions answered that maybe you've got. And again, it just uh, goes a little bit deeper than the course alone would do. If you're interested in either of those, you can see the full course outline, the link in the show notes, and that's um, v2pnutrition.com backslash course. And if you have any questions, send those over to me. If not, we will see you again here in a couple of weeks for another new episode. Hope you guys have a great week.